The history of Libya under Muammar Gaddafi spanned a period of over four decades from 1969 to 2011. Gaddafi became the de facto leader of the country on 1 September 1969 after leading a group of young Libyan military officers against King Idris I in a bloodless coup d'etat after the king had fled the country. The Libyan Revolutionary Command Council headed by Gaddafi abolished the monarchy and the old constitution and proclaimed the new Libyan Arab Republic, with the motto Freedom, Socialism, and Unity. After coming to power, the RCC government initiated a process of directing funds toward providing education, health care and housing for all. Despite the reforms not being entirely effective, public education in the country became free and primary education compulsory for both sexes. Medical care became available to the public at no cost but providing housing for all was a task the RCC government was not able to complete. Under Gaddafi, per capita income in the country rose to more than US $11,000, the fifth highest in Africa. The increase in prosperity was accompanied by a controversial foreign policy, with increased political repression at home. During the 1980s and 1990s, Gaddafi openly supported rebel movements like Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. The Palestine Liberation Organization, the Irish Republican Army and the Polisario Front, which led to a deterioration of Libya's foreign relations with several countries and that culminated in the U.S. bombing of Libya in 1986. After the 9-11 attacks, however, the relations were mostly normalized. In early 2011, a civil war broke out in the context of the wider Arab Spring. The anti-Gaddafi forces formed a committee named the National Transitional Council on 27 February 2011. It was meant to act as an interim authority in the rebel-controlled areas. After a number of atrocities were committed by the government, with the threat of further bloodshed, a multinational coalition led by NATO forces intervened on 21 March 2011 with the aim to protect civilians against attacks by the government's forces. At the same time, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant against Gaddafi and his entourage on 27 June 2011. Gaddafi was ousted from power in the wake of the fall of Tripoli to the rebel forces on 20 August 2011. Although pockets of resistance held by forces loyal to Gaddafi's government held out for another two months, especially in Gaddafi's hometown of Sirte, which he declared the new capital of Libya on 1 September 2011. The fall of the last remaining cities under pro-Gaddafi control and Sirte's capture on 20 October 2011, followed by the subsequent killing of Gaddafi, marks the end of the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, nomenclature. The name of the country was changed several times during Gaddafi's tenure as the leader. At first, the name was the Libyan Arab Republic. In 1977, the name was changed to Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. Jamahiriya was a term coined by Gaddafi, usually translated as State of the Masses. The country was renamed again in 1986 as the Great Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. Coup de Irkut TAT of 1969, the discovery of significant oil reserves in 1959 and the subsequent income from petroleum sales enabled the Kingdom of Libya to transition from one of the world's poorest nations to a wealthy state. Although oil drastically improved the Libyan government's finances, resentment began to build over the increased concentration of the nation's wealth in the hands of King Idris. This discontent mounted with the rise of Nasserism and Arab nationalism, socialism throughout North Africa and the Middle East. On 1 September 1969, a group of about 70 young army officers known as the Free Officers Movement and enlisted men mostly assigned to the Signal Corps, seized control of the government and in a stroke abolished the Libyan monarchy. 
The coup was launched at Benghazi, and within two hours the takeover was completed. Army units quickly rallied in support of the coup, and within a few days firmly established military control in Tripoli and elsewhere throughout the country. Popular reception of the coup, especially by younger people in the urban areas, was enthusiastic. Fears of resistance in Cyrenaica and Fez proved unfounded. No deaths or violent incidents related to the coup were reported. The Free Officers Movement, which claimed credit for carrying out the coup, was headed by a 12-member directorate that designated itself the Revolutionary Command Council. This body constituted the Libyan government after the coup. In its initial proclamation on 1 September, the RCC declared the country to be a free and sovereign state called the Libyan Arab Republic which would proceed in the path of freedom, unity, and social justice, guaranteeing the right of equality to its citizens, and opening before them the doors of honorable work, the rule of the Turks and Italians and their reactionary government just overthrown were characterized as belonging to dark ages from which the Libyan people were called to move forward as free brothers to a new age of prosperity, equality, and honor. The RCC advised diplomatic representatives in Libya that the revolutionary changes had not been directed from outside the country, that existing treaties and agreements would remain in effect, and that foreign lives and property would be protected. Diplomatic recognition of the new government came quickly from countries throughout the world. United States recognition was officially extended on 6 September. Post-coup in view of the lack of internal resistance, it appeared that the chief danger to the new government lay in the possibility of a reaction inspired by the absent King Idris or his designated heir. Hassan Arida, who had been taken into custody at the time of the coup along with other senior civil and military officials of the royal government. Within days of the coup, however, Hassan publicly renounced all rights to the throne, stated his support for the new government, and called on the people to accept it without violence. Idris, in an exchange of messages with the RCC through Egypt's President Nasser, dissociated himself from reported attempts to secure British intervention and disclaimed any intention of coming back to Libya. In return, he was assured by the RCC of the safety of his family still in the country. At his own request and with Nasser's approval, Idris took up residence once again in Egypt where he had spent his first exile and where he remained until his death in 1983. On 7 September 1969, the RCC announced that it had appointed a cabinet to conduct the government of the new republic. An American-educated technician, Mahmoud Suleiman al-Mughrabi, who had been imprisoned since 1967 for his political activities, was designated Prime Minister. He presided over the eight-member Council of Ministers, of whom six, like Mughrabi, were civilians and two, Adam said Hawaz and Musa Ahmed, were military officers. Neither of the officers was a member of the RCC. The Council of Ministers was instructed to implement the state's general policy as drawn up by the RCC, leaving no doubt where ultimate authority rested. The next day the RCC decided to promote Captain Gaddafi to colonel and to appoint him commander-in-chief of the Libyan Armed Forces, although RCC spokesmen declined until January 1970 to reveal any other names of RCC members. It was apparent from that date onward that the head of the RCC and new de facto head of state was Gaddafi. Analysts were quick to point out the striking similarities between the Libyan military coup of 1969 and that in Egypt under Nasser in 1952, and it became clear that the Egyptian experience and the charismatic figure of Nasser had formed the model for the Free Officers Movement. As the RCC in the last months of 1969 moved vigorously to institute domestic reforms, it proclaimed neutrality in the confrontation between the superpowers and opposition to all forms of colonialism and imperialism.
It also made clear Libya's dedication to Arab unity and to the support of the Palestinian cause against Israel. The RCC reaffirmed the country's identity as part of the Arab nation and its state religion as Islam. It abolished parliamentary institutions, all legislative functions being assumed by the RCC, and continued the prohibition against political parties, in effect since 1952. The new government categorically rejected communism, in large part because it was atheist, and officially espoused an Arab interpretation of socialism that integrated Islamic principles with social, economic, and political reform. Libya had shifted, virtually overnight, from the camp of conservative Arab traditionalist states to that of the radical nationalist states, Libyan Arab Republic. Attempted counter coups following the formation of the Libyan Arab Republic. Gaddafi and his associates insisted that their government would not rest on individual leadership, but rather on collegial decision making. The first major cabinet change occurred soon after the first challenge to the government. In December 1969, Adam said Hawaz, the Minister of Defense, and Musa Ahmad, the Minister of Interior, were arrested and accused of planning a coup. In the new cabinet formed after the crisis, Gaddafi, retaining his post as chairman of the RCC, also became prime minister and defense minister. Major Abdul Salam Jaloud, generally regarded as second only to Gaddafi in the RCC, became deputy prime minister and minister of interior. This cabinet totaled 13 members, of whom five were RCC officers. The government was challenged a second time in July 1970 when Abdullah Abid Sanasi and Ahmed al Sanasa, distant cousins of former King Idris, and members of the Saif and Nasser clan of Fezzan were accused of plotting to seize power for themselves. After the plot was foiled, a substantial cabinet change occurred, RCC officers for the first time forming a majority among new ministers. Assertion of Gaddafi's control from the start, RCC spokesmen had indicated a serious intent to bring the defunct regime to account. In 1971 and 1972 more than 200 former government officials, including seven prime ministers and numerous cabinet ministers, as well as former king, Idris and members of the royal family were brought to trial on charges of treason and corruption in the Libyan People's Court. Many, who like Idris lived in exile, were tried in absentia. Although a large percentage of those charged were acquitted, sentences of up to 15 years in prison and heavy fines were imposed on others. Five death sentences, all but one of them in absentia, were pronounced, among them, one against Idris. Fatima, the former queen, and Hassan Arida were sentenced to five and three years in prison, respectively. Meanwhile, Gaddafi and the RCC had disbanded the Sanasi order and officially downgraded its historical role in achieving Libya's independence. He also attacked regional and tribal differences as obstructions in the path of social advancement and Arab unity dismissing traditional leaders and drawing administrative boundaries across tribal groupings. The Free Officers Movement was renamed Arab Socialist Union in 1971, modelled after Egypt's Arab Socialist Union, and made the sole legal party in Gaddafi's Libya. It acted as a vehicle of national expression purporting to raise the political consciousness of Libyans and to aid the RCC in formulating public policy through debate in open forums. Trade unions were incorporated into the ASU and strikes outlawed. The press, already subject to censorship, was officially conscripted in 1972 as an agent of the revolution. Italians and what remained of the Jewish community were expelled from the country and the property confiscated in October 1970. In 1972, Libya joined the Federation of Arab Republics with Egypt and Syria but the intended union of pan-Arabic states never had the intended success and was effectively dormant after 1973. As months passed Gaddafi, caught up in his apocalyptic visions of revolutionary pan-Arabism and Islam locked in mortal struggle with what he termed the encircling, 
demonic forces of reaction, imperialism, and Zionism, increasingly devoted attention to international rather than internal affairs. As a result, routine administrative tasks fell to Major Jalud, who in 1972 became Prime Minister in place of Gaddafi. Two years later Jalud assumed Gaddafi's remaining administrative and protocol duties to allow Gaddafi to devote his time to revolutionary theorizing. Gaddafi remained commander-in-chief of the armed forces and effective head of state. The foreign press speculated about an eclipse of his authority and personality within the RCC, but Gaddafi soon dispelled such theories by his measures to restructure Libyan society. Alignment with the Soviet bloc after the September coup, U.S. forces proceeded deliberately with the planned withdrawal from Wheelis Air Base under the agreement made with the previous government. The last of the American contingent turned the facility over to the Libyans on the 11th of June 1970, a date thereafter celebrated in Libya as a national holiday. As relations with the U.S. steadily deteriorated, Gaddafi forged close links with the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries all the while maintaining Libya's stance as a non-aligned country and opposing the spread of communism in the Arab world. Libya's army, sharply increased from the 6,000-man pre-revolutionary force that had been trained and equipped by the British was armed with Soviet-built armor and missiles. Petroleum politics The economic base for Libya's revolution has been its oil revenues. However, Libya's petroleum reserves were small compared with those of other major Arab petroleum-producing states. As a consequence, Libya was more ready to ration output in order to conserve its natural wealth and less responsive to moderating its price rise demands than the other countries. Petroleum was seen both as a means of financing the economic and social development of a woefully underdeveloped country and as a political weapon to brandish in the Arab struggle against Israel. The increase in production that followed the 1969 revolution was accompanied by Libyan demands for higher petroleum prices a greater share of revenues, and more control over the development of the country's petroleum industry. Foreign petroleum companies agreed to a price hike of more than three times the going rate early in 1971. In December, the Libyan government suddenly nationalized the holdings of British petroleum in Libya and withdrew funds amounting to approximately $550 million, invested in British banks as a result of a foreign policy dispute. British Petroleum rejected as inadequate a Libyan offer of compensation, and the British Treasury banned Libya from participation in the Sterling area. In 1973, the Libyan government announced the nationalization of a controlling interest in all other petroleum companies operating in the country. This step gave Libya control of about 60% of its domestic oil production by early 1974, a figure that subsequently rose to 70%. Total nationalization was out of the question, given the need for foreign expertise and funds in oil exploration, production, and distribution. 1973 oil crisis insisting on the continued use of petroleum as leverage against Israel and its supporters in the West. Libya strongly urged the organization of petroleum exporting countries to take action in 1973, and Libyan militancy was partially responsible for OPEC measures to raise oil prices, impose embargoes, and gain control of production. On 19 October 1973, Libya was the first Arab nation to issue an oil embargo against the United States after U.S. President Richard Nixon announced the U.S. would provide Israel with a $2.2 billion military aid program during the Yom Kippur War. Saudi Arabia and other Arab oil-producing nations in OPEC would follow suit the next day, while the other Arab nations lifted their oil embargoes on 18 March 1974. The Gaddafi regime refused to do so. As a consequence of such policies, Libya's oil production declined by half between 1970 and 1974, while revenues from oil exports more than quadrupled. 
Production continued to fall, bottoming out at an 11-year low in 1975 at a time when the government was preparing to invest large amounts of petroleum revenues in other sectors of the economy. Thereafter, output stabilized at about 2 million barrels per day. Production and hence income declined yet again in the early 1980s because of the high price of Libyan crude and because recession in the industrialized world reduced demand for oil from all sources. Libya's five-year economic and social transformation plan, announced in 1975, was programmed to pump $20 billion into the development of a broad range of economic activities that would continue to provide income after Libya's petroleum reserves had been exhausted. Agriculture was slated to receive the largest share of aid in an effort to make Libya self-sufficient in food and to help keep the rural population on the land. Industry, of which there was little before the revolution, also received a significant amount of funding in the first development plan as well as in the second, launched in 1981. Transition to the Jamahiriya The remaking of Libyan society, contained in Gaddafi's ideological visions began to be put into practice formally in 1973, with a so-called cultural or popular revolution. This revolution was designed to create bureaucratic efficiency, public interest and participation in the sub-national governmental system, and national political coordination, in an attempt to instill revolutionary fervor into his compatriots and to involve large numbers of them in political affairs. Gaddafi urged them to challenge traditional authority and to take over and run government organs themselves. The instrument for doing this was the People's Committee. Within a few months, such committees were found all across Libya. They were functionally and geographically based, and eventually became responsible for local and regional administration. People's committees were established in such widely divergent organizations as universities, private business firms, government bureaucracies, and the broadcast media. Geographically based committees were formed at the governorate, municipal, and zone levels. Seats on the people's committees at the zone level were filled by direct popular election. Members so elected could then be selected for service at higher levels. By mid-1973 estimates of the number of people's committees ranged above 2,000. In the scope of their administrative and regulatory tasks and the method of their members' selection, the People's Committees purportedly embodied the concept of direct democracy that Gaddafi propounded in the first volume of the Green Book, which appeared in 1976. The same concept lay behind proposals to create a new political structure composed of people's congresses. The centerpiece of the new system was the General People's Congress, a national representative body intended to replace the RCC.